Thank you for joining us today. Just a few very quick reminders before we get started. All attendees are muted. If you are using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end. This session is TLP white and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator, Olivier Califf. Thank you and take it away, Olivier. Thanks. Uh, hello to all of you, virtual attendees. Uh, so I'm a first liaison and I work for Sanofi and I'm in charge of cyber resilience. So I'm very glad to introduce this presentation. Uh, and I was part of the 2020 program conference committee. Um, so uh, Mr. Benoit Dupont is a professor of criminology at the University of Montreal, the city that should have been welcoming us uh, this year in, in June for the conference. And he's been having a lot of activities uh, sharing um, cybersecurity uh, trainings, uh, research centers, and also representing the, the research community in various board of directors, such as the uh, CCTX. Uh, that said, uh, Mr. Benoit Dupont, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Olivier, and thank you for the invitation and for having me. I'm very aware I'm speaking to uh, cyber resilience professionals, so I'm going to try to uh, leave the uh, academic lingua and try to be very applied and, and to try to uh, uh, provide some added value uh, to that will be able to enrich your own work. So the, the title of the presentation is The Craft of Cyber Resilience, Lessons from the Trenches. And the perspective of uh, uh, this talk is to try to understand what uh, practitioners and cybersecurity professionals, and I'd like to see that name shift to cyber resilience professionals now, uh, practice resilience on a daily cyber resilience uh, and how they practice it on a daily basis. So um, a quick definition of cyber resilience, maybe for those of you who might not be as familiar with it, it's the capacity of an organization to limit the impact of cyber disruptions, to maintain functions, to resume very quickly normal operations. And something that to me is very important, I believe in cyber resilience is the ability to learn and uh, to adapt to the evolution of cyber risks and cyber threats. Um, and in, in the many dimensions, I think cyber resilience is an entirely different practice uh, than cybersecurity is. It has to in include and incorporate a lot of cybersecurity best practices, but it also something that is quite different. It's uh, not uh, past oriented. You cannot, it's the admission that you cannot predict and prevent all risks. You have also to prepare to survive the unexpected it's not about trying to prevent failure. It's about uh, organizing yourself uh, to fail safely. Uh, it's not about only focusing on security technologies. It's also understanding how those security technologies are incorporated into human systems. And it's not about protecting uh, simply your organization because you cannot be cyber resilient on your own. You have to work hand in hand with many other organizations in your extended network. So it's a holistic practice. I had planned to provide you with an overview of MERSC as the perfect example of cyber resilience, not planned cyber resilience, but forced cyber resilience. Uh, you all remember the NotPetya attack that MERSC uh, suffered in uh, June 2017. Where, and I think it's a perfect example because within seven minutes, the company lost all its computers almost 50,000 uh, 50, computers, 1,000 uh, 1, applications, all its servers, uh, well, not 50% of its servers were destroyed, but all its domain controllers uh, were also destroyed, phone lines unavailable, the perfect storm, the complete nightmare. And uh, its response, so obviously it was not cyber resilient because it was the victim of a, such an attack, uh, but the response, the first response was to abandon the crisis management protocol and hire external uh, consultants. It also had a stroke of luck because uh, one domain controller was found in Ghana because in Ghana there was a, a, a power outage at the time of the attack and it was uh, actually able to uh, rebuild the network from uh, that single domain controller. Uh, but also the human element played a very important part. The employees were able to maintain traffic via manual processes 
for 10 days using their own personal Gmail accounts and WhatsApp accounts and Excel sheets. Uh, and that's a good example of forced resilience. And the company was able to build, to rebuild the, its whole systems in four weeks at a massive cost. So if it had been more prepared for it, probably the cost would have been much less. Uh, but in the end, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a story that ends well. So th the purpose of my talk is to examine how companies can prepare better for this kind of attacks, massive attacks. And the way I did it is I uh, did a, a research over for two years, interviewing um, uh, almost 50 cybersecurity professionals in the financial sector. It's a study that was sponsored by the Global Risk Institute in Financial Services in Toronto, um, where I interviewed those uh, practitioners um, from 28 uh, companies, um, also uh, consultants providing incident response services and regulators across five countries, Canada, the US, the UK, France, and the Netherlands. And the question was, in the context of many consultant reports uh, selling, trying to sell cyber resilience and academics trying to build very elegant models of cyber resilience, the questions of the study were, how do you guys and, and girls on the first line of defense understand and practice cyber resilience and what works, what doesn't, and why? So this is the, the gist of my presentation today. Um, if you want, you can read the full report. I've got a link at the end of my presentation. And I uh, identified in this uh, study a dozen best practices uh, in the field of cyber resilience. I, I bucketed them in, in three main buckets. The sense-making practices, how do you interpret your risk landscape? What kind of challenges do you meet in the process? The response bucket, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and the adaptation bucket. I'm going to slightly touch on that as well today. In terms of uh, incident response as a, as a cyber resilience tool, I think uh, out of the interviews and, and, and from now on, what I'm going to uh, uh, share in this presentation is not my knowledge. It's the knowledge of those 44 people I interviewed uh, and the results of the analysis of those interviews. So it's not Benoit Dupont talking anymore. It's 44 cybersecurity experts. So their responses highlighted that the human factor was probably the most important element uh, to become cyber resilient. And many people told me people trump um, uh, uh, did, uh, computer systems and procedures uh, any time of the day when dealing with extreme, extremely disruptive cyber attacks. The people, your people are gonna save the company, not your systems because the systems have failed already. Your cybersecurity systems have failed. So it's you know, trying to look for the personal and psychological traits of high performing incident responders, their creativity, their flexibility, trying to find people and to add people to your teams who are very comfortable in high stress environments. And that, means, that doesn't mean they have to be reckless. It means they're usually very calm very uh, good communicators, very good listeners as well, because they have to communicate uh, to the other business units within your organization to uh, explain their decisions, but they also have to listen uh, from those business units, uh, their concerns when the decisions that you're imposing or making are gonna be very disruptive of the business processes that still have to, to be ongoing within the organization. To be able to hire and to retain those people you have to deploy uh, what I call anti-boredom strategies. So some companies um, develop cross-training programs where when they're not responding to incidents, people are training uh, their peers. Uh, other companies have developed rotation systems where every three months, every six months, people are rotated from one responsibility to another because those people are extremely curious, are extremely um, um, active, and uh, they need to be kept uh, uh, at all times really interested in, in what they're doing. Of course, you cannot only rely on uh, naturally gifted people. You have also to train uh, uh, a lot of your uh, incident responders and the broader uh, employee community. And most of organizations in the financial sector uh, do that using simulations and exercises that they have to run regularly to try to recreate the conditions of a cyber attack 
and the objective and the aim here is to develop general resources that can be adapted very quickly. So it's not to teach something that you have, you're going to have to repeat when the crisis occurs. It's about making people comfortable in crisis environments. And the analogy that I heard again and again is a developing, developing muscle memory. So you have you want to develop people who are comfortable in uncertain environments. Uh, and, and to achieve that, you, uh, may, you should make your training as realistic as possible, not too predictable, not training that still uh, that is done to uh, simply comply with the requirements of your regulators, not to check boxes and tick boxes, but really to uh, uh, create uh, challenging exercises for your uh, uh, team members. And not only involve the, the board, because very often um, uh, simulations are restricted to members of the board, but really have to make that available uh, to people in your incident response team, but also to the broader community. So people in business units, you have to start training them. Uh, how are we going to respond to an incident? In the case of MERSC, the whole company had to be all uh, uh, hands on, on, uh, on, on ship. Um, Many activities have been developed in other fields. I don't have time to go into that, but the defense sector, emergency response sectors have developed uh, tools and exercises that can really enhance the quality of the uh, incident response uh, capacities of an organization. Many organizations are, are developing playbooks. The importance of the playbooks is not what they tell you to do, but that you have gone through the exercise of planning how you're going to respond to a crisis. So I use a quote from uh, Churchill that the plans are not important. It's the planning exercise that led to these plans that is really important because you, you develop a way, a mindset that uh, places you in a space where you know what you're going to do, or if you don't know, you, you know how to think about responding to this type of incident. Uh, from the banks I interviewed, some of them maintain more than a dozen very specific playbooks that they review quarterly. Um, and don't fool yourself, it's a very consuming task because you must incorporate a variety of perspectives from all business units to make sure that your responses that are outlined in the playbook are aligned with the existing methodologies and uh, technologies that exist in your organization. So it's a very time consuming but very useful exercise. But also what I heard is that it's also as important to teach people to follow the playbook than to teach them to deviate from the playbook when you're experiencing an incident that is not recorded or not uh, included in the playbook. So you have to make people also comfortable to deviate from the playbook uh, when they are confronted with surprises. So in a nutshell, what you want to do and what you want to create in your uh, incident response plans and capacities is less bureaucracy and more jazz because uh, jazz uh, ensembles uh, are used to work with minimal structures and they know how to improvise, but they know how to improvise jointly to produce some very interesting pieces of music. And this is exactly the kind of analogy that you want to use in your organization. Of course, you cannot do that on your own. You, ha you have to develop internal and external networks. And when the crisis happens, is not the time when you are starting to build up your network. So you have to do that before and as an ongoing activity. So you have to plan the development of your internal and external networking activities. Internally, you have to avoid the segmentation of expertise. So companies are interviewed, uh, they uh, detach or they second security workers in business units. They create fusion centers to uh, create a, a much better situational awareness in the in a time of crisis. Um, some of them are also developing ambassador programs and the most inventive, I think, solution, not from the banking sector, but from Netflix, they have created a reservist program from, for incident responders. So they are training people to be second line incident responders, volunteers, like in the army, to, uh, to be able to uh, disseminate this kind of expertise throughout the organization. Externally, you have to also maintain extensive networks to be able to collect information very quickly and to access uh, surge capacities. You have to focus on third parties, especially in an environment where we are relying more and more on cloud services. 
And all those networks have to be based on trust and personal relationship that you have to build uh, again way before a crisis or a massive cyber shock happens to your organization. You have to learn to adapt. This is a very important um, capacity you have to develop. The ultimate goal of cyber resilience is not survival, but also learning to thrive in a new risk environment. And some of the companies I interviewed, actually they used the massive incidents and crisis they had to go through to develop new business offerings to their customers. And that's a very interesting idea that the crisis is going to add value to your business proposition once you've survived it. Uh, it's a bit counterintuitive. Um, so uh, often you want to develop post-incident reviews that reveal the inadequacies of existing security measures and the response processes that you have in place and that advocate um, um, changes and that's very political. So you have to create a safe environment for people to be able to collect and to share embarrassing data. And some of the organizations I visited and interviewed uh, have developed a no-fault learning approach where even the people at the uh, source of the crisis um, uh, were protected from the uh, repercussions so that uh, they could um, really share uh, their perspective uh, very freely and the organization could start uh, to uh, design uh, adequate responses. There are many challenges to cyber resilience. Uh, I've tried to outline them in this table. There are uh, heuristics or biases. There are 10 of them uh, based on uh, knowledge from disaster response and disaster management. Uh, I don't have time to go through all of them. I think it's more important to leave time aside for Q and A's, but I'm very happy to uh, revisit them uh, with you and they'll be available in the slides uh, after the conference or you can email me and I'll very happily send you uh, this table. Uh, so I'm going to stop here, I think, to leave time for uh, Q&As, but um, if you want to learn more, feel free to email me, and this is a, a, a screen capture of the cover of the re full report I wrote uh, that's freely available online for the Global Risk Institute, and uh, feel free to uh, download it and, and to share it uh, with your colleagues. I'm going to stop the screen sharing here, and Olivier, back to you. Okay, thank you, Benoit. Um, we've got a few questions. How could proactive steps help in curbing unforeseen attacks? A question from Ankita Saini. So uh, proactive steps means that uh, you are trying to maintain awareness of what your peers, your uh, competitors, or other organizations in your sector are experiencing. You're trying to uh, model uh, the likely attack, the most likely attacks you're going to suffer, and you're trying to train the whole workforce for that, and you're trying to put systems in place way before it happens uh, to, uh, to, to be prepared. So it's an investment in um, excess capacity, excess um, uh, resources, and of course uh, it brings me back to uh, one bucket I didn't have time to approach, which is the sense-making bucket, where, where you have to explain to your business units that the investments that you need to make to be proactive are, are not necessarily producing good uh, return on investments now, but th that you need this money to prepare for the future, which is very uncertain. So to be proactive, the first step you have to make is you have to convince management and the C-suite that they have really to set aside resources to prepare uh, for this type of uh, uh, nightmares that uh, uh, MERS, for example, or Equifax uh, suffered. And actually those use cases are very useful to, uh, for you uh, to convince uh, uh, the C-suite people and the people kind of who control access to the money that, so that you can then be uh, operationally proactive. But first you have to really convince the whole organization of the benefits of being proactive and of the benefits of investing money because you cannot be proactive without any resources. Okay, thank you. A question from Nicholas Liu. A question about the internal networking for large scale organizations. So do you see organizations having the problem where there are too many sub organizations that want to get involved or too many new organizations being stood up to the point where it convolutes your incident response process? 
Yeah, it's a very good question. And I must say that um, actually, um, because my study was done in the financial sector context, I, interview, I, I conducted interviews in organizations uh, that have like tens of thousands of employees all across the, and operate all across the world. Um, so I think that um, it's not necessarily a, a barrier, although you have to be very mindful of that. And uh, I think to overcome that uh, challenge, uh, you probably have to make sure that you're as close as you can be to conduct this kind of networking and to have the support uh, for those kind of internal networking activities from the very, very top of the organization. So a very good ex example of one organization where I conducted an interview, the CEO was the former chief risk officer. And he understood very well the uh, new uh, risk environment. And he was very supportive of those internal networking activities. And once he was behind the internal networking activities as one of the solutions to enhance the cyber resilience of the whole organization, it became much easier for the incident response people to be able to deploy those internal networking activities and to justify the resources and the time they needed to conduct those activities. So I agree with you, big organizations can um, be a challenge. And I think one uh, element of the response is, do you really have to get support? Uh, and I think one company I interviewed, they call that air cover. So if you're going on the ground, trying to do your operations and to do those, to, to build this gel between different business units and to create this internal networking, you need to ensure that you have air cover from the CEO or the, the CISO or the person, the, 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 the highest ranking person possible to uh, provide this message to the whole organization. This is really important. Pay attention to that. This is a question of survival for the company. And this also brings me to, the, uh, to another question about the SOC and the integration and the fusion center. It helps if you're also able to create, to integrate instead of creating a new organization to blend together existing um, organizations that provide this integration, this security function. So the fusion centers, they are very interesting because they, it's a new entity, but that brings together existing entities. It's not set up or stood up outside of existing entities. It forces existing entities to come and work together. On the same topic or extension, uh, what about regulations? Uh, can cyber resilience be regulated? For example, having regulated mandating that organizations should set up something? So uh, it's a very interesting question. We could have an entire new session on that. Um, so for actually for those very large organizations, it's, a, it's part of the challenge because the regulatory framework uh, when you operate in 60 countries is very different around cyber uh, um, resilience. Some countries like the UK or Singapore or the US are already starting to integrate uh, cyber resilience in their regulatory requirements. Others are lagging behind. But when you're a single entity operating across multiple jurisdictions, you have to take into account all these differences. And sometimes it's creating distortions. It's creating a lot of uncertainty. And it's making the, the job of incident responder, uh, responders more difficult. So I think that um, the, the people I interviewed, they found regulation very useful when it's not too intrusive and too, uh, not too um, uh, not providing too uh, uh, specific uh, guidance, uh, but it can also be um, uh, confusing when there is a flurry of regulatory uh, guidances and you don't know exactly which ones are the better and, and on, based on and, and what they are based and, and, and which one you should follow. So I think that uh, uh, regulations and, and um, softer forms of regulations like standards and standardization of cyber resilience, we haven't really reached yet the uh, maturity that we uh, should expect. And I think there is a lot more work to do, but some countries are really trying to embed cyber resilience in their regulatory framework. So that's something, it's something that's unfolding and developing at the moment. Uh, so people should really follow that space, uh, I believe. We've got a second question from Akita Saini, but it's a $1 million question. Since the attack is unforeseen, 
how could it be certain that steps taken are sufficient to handle it? So very good question. So you're never going to be able to take all the steps to handle it. What you want to do is you want to train the people. You want to have a diversity of systems that can handle a diversity of attacks, including attacks that you cannot imagine. So what you are trying to, de to develop and to um, train for is not a specific uh, procedure. It's not a, uh, to acquire a specific system to respond to a specific attack. It, it's what I call general resources that can adapt very quickly and that have enough space mindset and space to innovate and to respond and to be as creative as your attackers so it's a general capacity you're trying to develop not a specific capacity i agree with ankita you're never going to be able to plan for all possible attacks by definition another one from Indiana cordova is contingency plan part of cyber resilience yes it is part of cyber resilience if your contingency plan uh, is also practiced. If it's a contingency plan, as I've seen in some organizations, that remains on paper and that no one knows where to find, it's not part of cyber resilience. It's, uh, it's a document that's gathering dust. It's not helping cyber resilience. If your contingency plan is part of a broader process where you're consulting broadly, where you know, where you're including uh, the perspectives of many different business units, if it's a document that you use to uh, train people to simulate attacks that you tweak at regular intervals that you revisit that you include also your uh, external partners into to make sure your contingency plan is not only internal but is able to accommodate your whole uh, business network yes this is definitely part of cyber resilience and uh, a few more questions. Why crisis management plan need to be abandoned in some cases? So the reason is that uh, uh, because uh, crisis management plans are, uh, or playbooks, uh, as they are sometimes called, are uh, often built on very specific types of attacks. And as uh, the previous question um, uh, stated is sometimes uh, you have not envisaged uh, this type of attack because uh, the attacker has uh, completely shifted the, the, the risk landscape for you. Uh, and uh, there is no way you could have uh, uh, predicted what's going to what's happening. So you're if you're keeping on operating under an old risk model, the uh, outcome is that you're not going to be able to understand and to make sense of what's happening to you, you're going to be automatically uh, doing some things that maybe your attacker is actually um, uh, following you do online or is uh, kind of expecting you to do because he's also had access to your crisis management plan. So you sometimes have to abandon it. And I'm, I'm an academic, so I'm not selling anything. I'm not selling consulting services. Um, but you just sometimes have to recognize that it's more useful to abandon it because all the premises under which um, on which the plan was built are wrong now and you have to start with a clean slate and you have to really kind of build uh, the plane as you're flying because this is the state of uh, the crisis that you're experiencing so i'm not saying that it's you should abandon the plan every single time i i'm saying that you have to also recognize that sometimes this is something you have to do and to be able to do that you have to to be very confident in the ability of your team to replace that plan with something else that uh, responds to the new current crisis. And that's something that takes, a, I'm not saying it's easy, it's something that takes a lot of guts and a lot of confidence in your team and a lot of courage. And something very interesting that uh, the respondents I interviewed also told me, you have to be able to hire people who are also very acceptant of this reality, you're going to make some bad calls, you're going to make mistakes. And you shouldn't be paralyzed by that you should keep on moving and you should keep on making decisions, uh, because otherwise you're going to be paralyzed. The um, uh, fighter jet pilots call that the startle effect. And you have also to train people to avoid the startle effect. Uh, final question, one minute remaining. Are there any experts or qualified professionals in cyber resilience? other than 
incident responders? Yes, th th there, there, there is a range of other experts and a, a range of consultants that uh, you can call on to, but um, it, it's, it, you know, if you're calling, if you keep on keeping those people on, on retainer, um, uh, they, they can bring some very, very um, um, specialized expertise. Uh, but uh, wouldn't you want to develop this kind of expertise in-house if you're a massive or a big organization? This is a, this is a bit uh, something that uh, wasn't um, uh, clear-cut in the interview is uh, uh, I consulted. Some of them believed it was better to develop internal capacity. Others were more comfortable bringing in this external expertise, but uh, there are uh, some uh, boutique shops uh, providing cyber resilient services with uh, highly qualified people and doing crisis management. And sometimes they are doing also uh, 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 crisis management outside of the cyber realm, uh, but it can be brought in for this kind of uh, uh, big crisis in the cyber security space. Okay, so thank you, Benoit, at the end of this, uh, this session. Thanks for your good presentation, uh, answering the questions, and I really appreciated it uh, being in the same, in the same topic. Uh, thank you to all the attendees. So that was the uh, final presentation for the day. You have a final session as the uh, conference closure. Uh, so thanks. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and uh, hope to see you face to face uh, for the next conference next year. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you, Benoit.